So, you guys hear me? Good? Okay, terrific. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to tell you a bit about uh, what's been going on in my lab over the last, I don't know, uh, seven, eight years uh, in the, this field of diamond photonics. Uh, as uh, Alexa mentioned, I am uh, special uh, engineer by training in terms of cyber physics. Uh, I started my career in power electronics, and then I got bored with that, and then I decided sound electronics, and that's what I do now. Uh, though actually, power electronics became very big later too. So maybe I'll do some nano power electronics at some point. Okay, so in my group, uh, and this is I think exactly a year old photo now. So some of the people are not there anymore. But we basically uh, are interested in uh, uh, developing kind of functional photonic devices in interesting materials. So it's kind of device physics approach, let's say, with some application maybe. 100 years from now, but always some application in mind. Uh, our expertise is in nanofab, so we like to work with difficult materials, like diamond was one, lithium niobate is another one. We do a lot of machining. Silicon is often a platform that we try our ideas on. And we are wavelength agnostic, so we do all over wavelength range and also all over different power levels, actually, from kind of single photons to gigawatts uh, lately, and some high power optics in diamonds we've been developing. There's just some of the examples of stuff that I won't talk a lot, a uh, whole lot about today, but we do quite a bit of nonlinear photonics these days. Uh, if you're in photonics, you are sure to do some metal materials, just like if you do transport, you do graphene and stuff like that. So we do some metal materials. Uh, actually, now these days, combining some metal materials with quantum photonics as well. We do quite a bit of work in mid infrared photonics, uh, uh, more in passive photonics these days, building frequency comps, for example, for a gas spectroscopy application. But today I'd like to tell you mostly about our diamond work. And uh, I'd like to start with this slide that summarizes many nice properties of diamond. Uh, uh, it's essentially super material, hero material, if you will. It uh, has the best thermal conductivity excellent mechanical properties, chemically inert, biocompatible, wide band gap material, so we can potentially uh, draw, uh, put a lot of current through it. This is uh, power electronics. Uh, and optically, actually, is, uh, has brought large enough refractive index that you can build devices in it, and it's very transparent over wide wavelength range. So I want to spend another minute or so talking about uh, optical properties of diamond. So here is a transparency window. Uh, I, this is absorption as a function of wavelength. So basically, it's transparent from UV, the band gap is about 220 nanometers, to um, uh, kind of the short wave mid infrared, and then again from about six microns or so on, all the way to millimeter waves even. There's a bit of absorption in, in this kind of mid infrared wavelength range here, and these are multi phonon absorption processes. So if you don't work here, you can actually exploit uh, this nice transparency window. It has nice nonlinearity, both Kerr and Raman, and we are using these things for some uh, frequency column application I'll briefly mention later. So in my group, we looked into ways to actually exploit these properties uh, for different applications uh, in non phenomenological order, more like kind of wavelength, going from longest wavelengths to, to the shortest. We did some work uh, in high power optics and 10.6 micron wavelengths. This is uh, actually uh, funded by this company, Element 6, that and now is branded as a pure optics product. This is diamond window that's transparent at 10.6 that can handle a lot of power. Uh, we did a lot of work in the linear optics, um, uh, Raman lasers and frequency comps at this wavelength range. Uh, uh, lately, we've been doing a lot of work for directed energy, or uh, another name for uh, uh, laser weapons, basically. Uh, 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 well, we don't do laser weapons, but this could be used as a mirror for laser weapons. Uh, and uh, also, uh, what's the, the field that started this all um, is quantum tonics and lately some quantum optomechanics uh, using diamonds, both nice quantum properties as well as mechanical properties. So this is sort of the outline what I'd like to tell you today. Uh, so uh, mostly everything revolves about color sensors in diamond. I'd like to tell you about some early attempts to make photonics platform in diamond. Um, and some problems with especially nitrogen vacancy color center, then which led us to develop new fabrication techniques that led to this nice work that was recently published uh, uh, on uh, cavity QED with silicon vacancy color centers in diamond. And then I'd like to conclude with some ideas of how we can combine mechanical degrees of freedom with optical 
and maybe exploit, uh, try to use phonons as information carriers and diamond chip perhaps. Uh, this is more kind of looking ahead. Uh, so diamond is a quantum gem, but re which really I mean uh, there's a bunch of different color centers uh, that actually gem industry knew for quite some time, they used them to color the, the gemstones, right? If you have a lot of nitrogen, your gemstone is yellow. If you have a lot of boron, it's blue. If you have a lot of nitrogen vacancies, a lot of defects, uh, it can get pink. Pinks are very expensive if they're natural uh, because they're very rare. Uh, and uh, also what has been recognized relatively recently, maybe 15 years ago now, maybe 15 to 20 years ago, that some of these color centers are actually very nice single photon sources and are interesting quantum emitters. And, and here is a brief summary of some of these color centers uh, as a function of wavelength. And with errors, we, uh, 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 what, what this was actually taken from Igor Ahorona, which is a review article uh, mentioned here. With arrow, they indicate color centers that have spin uh, memory, a spin associated with it that can be addressed optically and can be used as a memory. So, so this is main interest really behind these diamond color centers that they are excellent quantum memory that can be addressed optically. And so over the years, uh, uh, we and the community at large uh, looked at many different color centers. Here are, are some that we looked at Harvard. Uh, uh, so uh, we started with nitrogen vacancy color center, spent a lot of years uh, developing photonic, quantum photonics platform around this. Uh, that didn't really go very far, I'll tell you why. Spent another year or two on silicon vacancy that read pretty far. And then another month or so, maybe a little more, on germanium vacancy, and this seems like working really well. So, so the germanium vacancy is color center is the one I think is probably the most interesting for future application. The most of the work today I'll tell you will be about silicon vacancy color center. But, but these are basically defects in the lattice of diamond. So blue are carbon atoms, and they form these centers by essentially typically knocking out two carbon atoms. Uh, these are these vacancies. And then in the case of NV, you replace one vacancy with nitrogen. This can be done by with ion implantation or via growth. And there's beautiful work here done by uh, Phil Hammer on growth and obviously Alexei uh, Akimov uh, and Alexei others whose name I cannot pronounce. Uh, there's so many Alexeis here. So I just to say, Alexeis do great work on uh, quantum photonics with diamond. Uh, 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 on NV and lately on silicon vacancy color centers, which is formed by wedging silicon atom between two vacancies, then germanium is similarly done. The same way. So I'll come back to these uh, a little later, mostly but talk about silicon vacancy. So, but I'd like to start with the one that started it all, which is this nitrogen vacancy color center and summarizes its nice properties that were discovered. Basically, it's, it has a emission spectrum shown here. This is low temperature emission. Uh, it has a zero phonon line, which is atomic like emis emission. It's very narrow, ideally spectrally stable. And also, it has also this phonon sideband. This is uh, emission assisted by phonons. Uh, so it's not ideal quantum emitter, but it's excellent quantum memory due to this level, simplified level diagram. Basically, what you can do, you can prepare spin state by applying RF fields, about 3 gigahertz, as well as combination of green and red, sometimes yellow and orange photons. You can prepare spin state. You can manipulate spin state. And you can read it out all optically. Uh, this is uh, really nice. Uh, if you uh, want to do, let's say, quantum communication uh, type of application, or uh, magnetic field or uh, magnetic field sensing, if you want to build quantum sensors, and there's a lot of work here around these things, where this once you prepare a spin state, it gets affected by magnetic field locally, and you can do measurements on these weak magnetic fields. One of the nice things that was demonstrated in Mission Lukens Lab was my collaborator uh, for many years now, which is how I got to know Alexei, uh, is they demonstrated is this spin memory, electron spin memory, and we can be extended by coupling it via carbon, proximal carbon-13 nuclear memory. And they demonstrated uh, uh, spin coherence times of seconds at room temperature. So it's excellent quantum memory, even at room temperature. And the question was, can we make this improve the optical properties, which is what was my kind of interest. And ideally, what we would like to do is this build quantum repeater that works based on entanglement distribution. So we would like to have some. Uh, or maybe I'll, I'll show this figure first. This is actually a demonstration of uh, one kind of uh, uh, one link between two distance diamonds that was recently demonstrated at uh, Delft in uh, Ron Hansen's lab. Uh, and also they demonstrated last year this loophole free belt test. So basically, what they did, they have two diamond piece, uh, bulk diamonds, uh, bulk diamond crystals uh, uh, separated by a kilometer or so uh, on TU Delft uh, 
uh, campus, and they were able to entangle spins between these two diamonds by essentially doing first first spin photon entanglement in each of these diamonds, and then interfering photons at the bean splitter that was positioned here. And then they were able to essentially entangle spin here and spin there. And now the idea is, if I repeat this picture, you know, and cascade it, I can be entangling these two guys, and then these two guys, and then do some measurements here, entangle these two guys. And if I can store quantum information long enough in each of these nodes, uh, I can actually uh, make distribute this entanglement over a very long distance and use it as a resource for secure communication. So this is the idea. This is, uh, uh, you know, just mirror image of this thing. This nobody has done this yet, but this is what, what we would like to do. Uh, and there are quite a few problems with this thing, which uh, we wanted to address. So first of all, NV Center has very weak emission into zero phonon line. Only five percent of emission goes into this spectrally pure uh, uh, line. Everything else, 95 percent of the time, you emit photons that are useless. So this is not very good. Second. Uh, diamond has high refractive index, so again, only 5% of the time, photon that you do emit, 5% of the time, gets out of diamond, right? So you have 0 0.05 times 0 0.05 probability per excitation that you see photon at the wavelength that you want. And then once you have this photon, you shoot it into the fiber, uh, and, and, and this is red photon, and fiber losses for red are huge, so this photon doesn't go very far. And then also there's a problem with spectral diffusion and, and homogeneity between NVs. So if you want to do this interference, these two NVs need to be the same wavelength, which can be done by some stark tuning and whatnot. I'm not going into details. But also if you have any sort of spectral diffusion, if this line is wobbling, then probability of getting entanglement is actually really low. So in this experiment here, they were getting, I think, one entanglement every 10 minutes. So that means the rate is extremely like millihertz. It's probably faster to send somebody on a bike from here to here with a suitcase and transmit quantum information. So the question was, can this be improved? And it's sort of kind of obvious or uh, straightforward, though slight, very complex approach to do this is uh, basically to put a cavity around uh, a, a, an emitter. Uh, people have done this with the atoms, with quantum dots, uh, whatnot. So if I have an optical resonator that I tune to this uh, zero phonon line, and if I have very high quality factor, very small resonator, then I can enhance this emission by many, uh, many fold. And potentially I can hope to get that 99% of the time I get photon at this wavelength as opposed to anywhere else. So basically we need very good cavities that are very small. Also once I emit photon into cavity, I can easily collect that photon by coupling cavity to the waveguide, which is something the photonics community that I belong to know how to do well. And also, if I make all of this in nonlinear material, and by the way, diamond has nice chi tree nonlinearity, I can maybe do four-way mixing process and take this red photon to telecom, everything in the same chip, potentially. So our big picture, our big goal is to build diamond platform that consists of diamond resonators with color centers coupled to diamond waveguides, having some maybe superconducting diamond detectors in the end, uh, and do all of this, can realize quantum node for quantum repeater all in, in diamond. This is uh, 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 kind of big picture. It's, uh, there are other ways how we can simplify this a bit, uh, but this is what we would like to do uh, down the road and make it also very efficient. Okay, so uh, the cavity that my group has spent a lot of time playing with is this so-called photonic crystal nanobeam cavity. It's essentially a Faber-Perot resonator. So if you, if you do any sort of free space optics or, you know, or if you know what the optical mirror is, then they, the, the way you can make simple cavities, you put two mirrors back to back and here I'm showing two dielectric mirrors and you just form the cavity in between. So we do the same thing on chip uh, in, uh, is to have this variation of refractive index contrast. We basically have a piece of diamond. We would like to have a piece of diamond with holes in it. So diamond is high refractive index 2.4, hole is low refractive index of one a pair. And this may make this mirror. You have two mirrors, one left, one right. In between, you have cavity. You put your mirror, and sort of you're done. And, and uh, in my group, uh, we've done a lot of work before we started doing, looking into diamond, uh, making all kinds of cavities in all kinds of materials. And here is an example of silicon photonic crystal cavity. This, color, this chirped mirror. Uh, if you're a laser guy, this reminds you maybe of a chirped DFB laser, except the index contrast here is very strong. So it's more of this kind of photonic crystal regime. Uh, so, so basically, uh, this chirp lattice allows you to trap light in the middle and also allows you to have very efficient transmission of light from here to here. Tun essentially, tunneling is very, very good. Uh, 
Uh, so we wanted to do this all in diamond, but here was the problem, uh, or to, to, do, to make these devices for nanophotonics, what you need to have, you need to have index contrast. You typically rely on high index material on top of low, low index material. You confine light vertically, and then you drill holes in this high index material to make lateral confinement, and that's your resonator. Uh, if you want to do mechanical device, or even sometimes optical device, instead of low index material, you need to have sacrificial material that you remove and have freestanding structure. The problem with diamond is this high quality diamond substrate come only in bulk form. You can have thin film of diamond deposited on anything else, but then you get polycrystalline structures, and that's not very good for what we want to do. It's good for MEMS applications, people have done this, but for quantum photonics it's not good due to uh, losses, scattering losses, sometimes emission on SP2 bonds and whatnot. So, uh, so basically we're stuck with these bulk diamond crystals, single crystals that are grown by, for us, company Element 6 grows them. They're very pure, but uh, how do we make devices out of them? So uh, we've done, well, developed a few platforms to do that, and here is a kind of second one uh, that we developed, and it's very brute force approach that uh, we call thin diamond film photonics, or diamond thin, thin film, diamond thinning. We start with about two, two, uh, 20 to 30 micron stick piece of diamond. Uh, we then put it in reactive ion etcher. Essentially, we strike plasma, we have oxygen. Oxygen attacks diamond, makes carbon dioxide. You pump carbon dioxide out, you know, and you keep thin eating away diamond. Uh, if you're patient enough, or if your student is patient enough, then you stop just before you remove all diamond. You stop at one micron thickness or a half micron. Uh, often you don't, and then you need to start all over again. Uh, and then you do electron beam lithography, you do etching, remove the mask. Sometimes we do undercutting to have freestanding structure, sometimes we don't. The bottom line is we have this cavity. So here are some attempts from a few years ago already. Uh, and uh, so basically here is a diamond waveguide. You, there are holes in it. I don't know if you can see them here. This is side view, so you, you don't see holes very well here, but this is top view, there are holes. And there are diamond waveguides. So this diamond was positioned on silicon dioxide substrate, and then silicon dioxide was eaten away with hydrofluoric acid, so you have this freestanding structure, okay? Uh, so, and then in this case, we were lucky. We made many of them, and we looked around in confocal microscope, and we found that some of them have color centers right in the middle, and then we focused uh, on those. Uh, first, we confirmed that these, these are indeed single color centers, single nitrogen vacancy centers. Uh, as you can see by this uh, anti bunching curve. If you're not used to see these dips, then just believe me, this means that there's one color sensor there. Uh, and then also we looked into uh, if, if this cavity enhances emission. Remember, we wanted to build a cavity to enhance emission properties so that most of our light gets out to zero point online. And so here, basically, when we start, when we build, build our resonator, our resonate, resonator due to fabrication tolerance is roughly five nanometers away from our color center wavelength, and then we start tuning the resonator uh, in resonance with color center, and then as we do so, we see there's more and more emission coming out of it. And this was very nice and, and uh, exciting to us. We were able to enhance emission by a factor of seven, which is nowhere uh, as close. We really need, wanted to do this by a factor of 100, give or take. Uh, and so then what we also observed was kind of disappointing, and this was the fact that uh, uh, these color centers, when they are placed in nanostructure, they become really bad. They are, the optical coherence goes down significantly. Uh, so in bulk, these nitrogen vacancy color centers have very nice stable emission. Uh, for example, a, a, if, as I do these scans at different time instances, you would see this emission spectrum just being like one straight line up. But when I have NV in nanostructure, the, this zero phonon line emission that we are interested in wobbles around. And that's really bad because if I want to interfere two of these uh, photons that uh, have uncertain wavelength uh, of frequency at which they operate, my probability of entanglement goes down significantly. I need to try more times. This was really bad. And uh, it's actually one of the main problems that this kind of uh, community is facing with color centers, with nitrogen vacancy color center. It's a beautiful, stable memory. Still, these, these guys have very nice um, uh, spin memory properties in nanostructures even, but it's really uh, optical coherence it, uh, goes down significantly. So uh, it was evident that basically, uh, uh, also from these experiments, what, what we observed is that if we anneal diamond or do some surface treatments, and, and Phil Hammer here is doing a lot of nice work in that regard, 
uh, we potentially can passivate these surfaces to kind of recover stability of NV centers. And this is ongoing effort. It's been ongoing for like three, four years. Okay, it's, it's a hard problem. I, I mentioned this once today. I mentioned it for you as well. I was so disappointed with this, and I kind of like, you know, really sad that the surface states are affecting our properties. But then I heard talk from a guy from Intel who said uh, this uh, anecdote uh, that he heard somewhere. Uh, basically, God made bulk and devil made surfaces. So apparently, surface science, surface stuff, you know, is known to be a big problem. And uh, for us, being engineers and physicists, Misha and I, uh, this is a really big problem. We probably didn't know how to solve it. And the community still doesn't know. But it was obvious that annealing helps. Uh, cleaning uh, devices and aggressive acid helps. But, not, uh, but the problem here is if I want to anneal these things at high temperatures, I have diamond and glass, and due to different the thermal expansion coefficients, actually these things would just be laminate. Okay, they were not bonded strongly enough. So we, it was clear that we need better fabrication technique uh, that would be compatible with these annealing and aggressive cleaning protocols, so we can, uh, if we have any hope you know, of kind of recovering nice NV properties, still work in progress. Uh, before I show you some techniques that we developed to uh, alternative fabrication techniques that we developed, I want to show you this. Uh, success of, of this thin film technology that uh, we developed. This is in non-quantum realm now. Basically, uh, after a few years of perfecting thinning diamond, we, we were now a, we are at the point where we can make really kind of integrated networks in, in diamond. So what you see here is diamond ring resonator coupled to diamond waveguide. And these are some polymer couplers that allow us to have very efficient uh, uh, coupling of light from fiber in into the resonator out and into the fiber with overall transmission efficiency of around 50%. So light photon that starts here in this fiber ends up in this fiber 50% of the time. So this is very, very good. And what we use this, and also in, in visible valence range, we show that these resonators can have quality factors of about 500,000, so which is very important uh, for the uh, figure of merit. Uh, and uh, uh, so, well, okay, so this is, I guess, more later. The, result, the latest result is 90% transmission efficiency. Uh, uh, though I think this is for telecom, actually, not for red. Uh, so uh, uh, what we are using these for is nonlinear optics. So when we put a lot of light here, we can actually uh, make Raman laser out of these devices. And here is an example of visible Raman laser. We pump at 700, uh, 20 or so nanometers, and then we get essentially a Stokes line uh, 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 with the gain at about 780 nanometers. And, and diamond is very nice because it has huge Raman shape of 40 terahertz. So it can allow you really uh, to do something that's hard to do with other materials. For example, here uh, we show that pretty much on the same chip using similar devices, we can generate also Raman laser and mid infrared wavelength range. So we pump at 1.5 micron wavelength, we get two micron light out. So we can essentially, we can use this to get coherent light at wavelengths that you don't have easily available to you by pumping with kind of you know, like simple dial laser. Uh, what we are really interested in is this frequency comb. And here is now again our diamond waveguide on diamond, half of diamond ring resonator on the silica. And we are basically building these uh, frequency combs out of diamonds. So here is the one that operates telecom valence range uh, that supports solitons, uh, essentially. And the push is, uh, this is some work funded by DARPA program to make, uh, make these micro resonator based on chip frequency comb invisible wavelength range. So here's some theoretical plot of what such comp uh, emission would look like. So we'll pump it at 532 nanometers, and we will be getting light from 400 to 800 nanometers. And this will be of interest for, uh, uh, for example, uh, car spectroscopy, as well as uh, if we can get them to be very stable to couple uh, atomic clocks. So we are working with Junier at uh, Gila uh, about essentially replacing Essentially, they're tie up lasers and big oscillators with these diamond-based oscillators once we make them invisible. Right now, we have them in telecom, but they're pushing visible hard. OK, so these are two kind of success stories of this thin film platform that was not very good for uh, quantum optics. Uh, uh, but now I'd like to switch back to quantum optics and tell you a bit about new fabrication technique that we developed that allowed us to actually get uh, somewhere. So, so the idea was again. Remember, if we have two, if we have heterogeneous structure that consists of two materials, like diamond and silica, uh, if I anneal things very high temperatures, due to thermal stresses, things uh, delaminate. So I wanted to make structure that consists only of diamond. 
So uh, my hope was to fabricate things, uh, uh, carve devices inside diamond. <clears throat> and for that, we developed two techniques. One is uh, both of them are based on angle latching. Uh, and uh, this is kind of an uh, illustration of how this works. So normally when you do etching, you like to etch devices vertically. Uh, but the problem is then uh, uh, you don't have index contrast. Because as long as you etch, uh, you always have diamond underneath. And that diamond that substrate underneath is going to be a lost channel for your photon. So we, in order to prevent this, we need to kind of have low index material underneath our diamond waveguide. And air is very good at low index material. So basically, what we decided to do, we're going to etch diamond at an angle to form this uh, kind of freestanding waveguide, uh, and the light can propagate them from here to there. The way we do this, we modify our chambers, actually. And uh, folks at Harvard Clean are very nice. They let us do all the cra these crazy things. We make these Faraday cages that we put in our uh, uh, reactive ion etching chamber that essentially we have plasma inside. Uh, and uh, this, this metallic mesh actually prevents the electric field buildup inside. This mesh, and we put a piece of diamond inside. Maybe you can see it here. And then, basically, as a consequence, uh, ions are accelerated perpendicular to this wall of this uh, Faraday cage. And then, once they inside the Faraday cage, they, they essentially just follow the same trajectory and attack the diamond that is here at an angle. So these lines here are the ionic uh, trajectories of ions. So using this, and this is one approach. Another approach is a lot simpler, but at the time we didn't have this tool. Now we purchased it. So this is just simple IOB milling, where we put sample at an angle and attack, essentially, with the ion beams. And then you put sample is spinning, and you get, again, the same much effect. But both techniques allow you really to go from here to there. So this is standard fabrication, nice vertical sidewalls of diamond. In this case, is diamond wire. We put some mask, and here's diamond wire. If I do this angle latching, instead of sidewalls, I, uh, straight sidewalls, I have undercut sidewalls. And if I now, instead of having a little pillar, if I extend this into waveguide, uh, then I can make structures like this. So here is a diamond waveguide okay, that are carved inside diamond surface. There's no need for thin films. This is essentially I can make this, or my students can, I can, uh, on your uh, you know, like wedding ring, basically. This is all done in a bulk diamond. Okay? This is like a diamond waveguide supported by diamond sitting on diamond. Uh, and these are, with, after a few years of, of uh, improving this, we can make all kinds of structures now, like this. This unconventional technology still allows us to do almost anything. Uh, again, everything is diamond on diamond, supported by diamond. So here is, for example, ring resonator. Uh, this is diamond ring supported by these two diamond fingers or diamond substrate. These guys have very nice quality factors, telecom invisible. Uh, we can make them very long, about two millimeters. This is for some frequency convert. This is some attempt to make brilliant laser out of diamond. Uh, here's some, some meta materials for high power optics applications, for example. <laughs> but of interest for this work, uh, for quantum communities, that we can make this type of uh, nanobeam cavities that I started uh, telling you about in the beginning. So here is, again, uh, 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 diamond cavity, diamond support on diamond substrate. Uh, and uh, the, we, by, by engineering this, this uh, whole profile, the chirp profile, we can trap light in the middle. Uh, when we make these devices in the uh, telecom, uh, quality factors on the order of 200,000, which is pretty good. When we make them invisible valence range, they're on the order of 10,000, which is OK. OK, we would like these quality factors to be like order, or maybe two orders maybe larger, so that our Purcell factor that I mentioned, that our enhancement of emission is much, much better. Okay. So we changed fabrication pr approach, but we also changed uh, uh, an emitter. But I'm going to tell you about this later, after I first go back to NV. Uh, so, so with this, we were really excited. We started now incorporating these uh, angled edge devices with NV centers that were implanted. And this was actually work that was done primarily in, in Michel Lukin's lab on uh, these devices that we fabricated. And they were able to observe that, OK, in these devices, even in our nanobeam cavities, we can have NV uh, lines, 0 photon lines in the order of gigahertz, which is much broader than natural 0 photon line. But it's also about 100 times better than from what we had before. OK, we had these lines wobbling all over the place. And in some cases, we even had these lines to be, in nano devices, very narrow. Okay? But still, uh, as I'm uh, even even now, these structures allow, allow us to do annealing at high temperature, very aggressive cleaning, 
surface termination, whatnot. Still, the community has not figured out these issues with surfaces, and, and the NVs inside even these nanostructures are suffering from speculative diffusion, sometimes even blinking. Uh, so, so there's still a lot of work to be done there. Uh, for us, uh, we also started looking at that time at other color centers, and uh, especially in silicon vacancy color center, which is more robust uh, quantum emitter, it turned out. Uh, and so I just to get a brief intro to silicon vacancy color center. I know that uh, there's a lot of people here uh, looking into that as well. So basically, it's uh, now a silicon atom that's sandwiched between two missing carbon atoms, between two vacancies. And due to the symmetry, uh, uh, there's no permanent uh, electric dipole. Unlike in NV, we have a nitrogen vacancy, so there's no symmetry in the structure. There's permanent electric dipole. And because of the lack of this permanent electric dipole, as shown here, uh, silicon vacancy turns out to be a lot less sensitive to electric fields, and therefore a lot less sensitive to electric field fluctuations, which could be caused by some unpaired uh, dangling bonds on the surfaces, uh, surface state fluctuations, and whatnot. Uh, this is kind of simplified level diagram. Uh, uh, there is uh, uh, four lines. Uh, there's four peaks in emission that you can see. Zero phonon line is much stronger than in case of NV, which is another nice thing. What's not so nice is that uh, its uh, quantum yield is not 100%. There's significant non-radiative component, but still, as an emitter, it's much brighter than NV, for example. The big problem with silicon vacancy is that its spin coherence time is significantly lower, roughly two to three orders of magnitude, even more than the nitrogen vacancy color center. But I'll, I'll mention this a little later, and as well as some ideas how to improve that. So now what we did, and this is work that we've done in collaboration with Misha Lukin and also a group at Sandia National Labs who helped us with uh, focus on beam implantation. So we fabricate our devices, then we send them to Sandia. And what they do, they find these devices, there are markers around it I'm not showing you, and using focus time beam implanter, not focus time beam milling, uh, they essentially put a handful of silicon atoms right in the middle where our cavity is. And then we take these devices and anneal them. And this is now really a unique property of, of this method, as well as diamond, that we can anneal these freestanding devices at 1400C for many hours and nothing happens to them. And then we can put them in aggressive acids that are boiling and nothing happens to them. I mean, we remove uh, uh, defects from surfaces, but nothing bad happens happen to them. Good things happen to them, I guess I should say. This is a focal image of these two devices. You can see emission coming from the middle, so we form vac silicon vacancies. Uh, and then these are some experiments that are recently just appeared in science. This is work uh, uh, that was led by Alp. Uh, so basically, first uh, we did transmission measurements to so excite the structure from this end and measured their, their transmission and looking at luminescence. So if you look at luminescence, you see if you start exciting these resonantly, you see that uh, if you, in photons emitted here, you see three emission peaks, which are three color centers that we had in this cavity in this case. If I measure transmission, I see broad ca cavity resonance, and on top of it, I see three dips, and these three dips are essentially exactly uh, happen at the same point when I have these three emission peaks, which really means that the silicon vacancy here, single silicon vacancy, in, in a, uh, like three different silicon vacancies, but each of them behaves independently, they absorb and kind of block photons from uh, entering cavity and then reroute these single photons outside the cavity, basically. And so this is the blow up one of these dips. Essentially, what we found out is that one silicon vacancy can uh, result in 40% blockage of incidence photons. So this is uh, this is very nice. Uh, and uh, I'm going to interest of time just focus on this. When we looked into kind of parameters of this structure, uh, especially this cooperativity, which is important figure of merit in a kind of cavity QED that tells you the re re relationship between emitter, uh, like kind of light matter interaction. This is coupling rate between photon and emitter. Uh, 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 and, and look at the ratio of that with photon escape rate from the cavity and emitter decoherence, essentially. Uh, if this can be on the order of one, or ideally 10 or 100, then we are in this kind of strong cooperativity limit where basically photon and emitter will, uh, it's more uh, likely that they will interact than that photon will be lost to, uh, to the free space or that the emitter will just decohere. Okay. So we are now in the limit of this cooperativity is one, which is actually quite exciting, but we're also pushing and we have devices that already should put us in limit with cooperativity in the order of factor of 10. Okay, so 
one thing that was not so good here was that our coupling, uh, pro like ideally if you want to build some quantum network out of this, I would like to cascade a bunch of these uh, single photon switches, if you will. Uh, and for that, I need to have nice coupling efficiency of photons in and out of the structure. Right now we use these notches at the end of the waveguide, which gives you coupling efficiency of 10% each, maybe less. So it was not very good. So we looked into ways to kind of improve on that and also really start building integrated photonics network on diamond that go beyond one device, right? So here is some recent results where we basically have this bunch of different uh, diamond waveguides. In somewhere in the middle of the waveguide, we have resonator. And in the end of the waveguide, we have these little uh, tapered waveguide sections uh, where we land our optical fiber onto them. So here's diamond, this toothpick, let's say, and here's a diamond, uh, uh, optical fiber that we make using a, a hydrophoric acid erosion. And uh, when you touch properly, you can get transmission efficiency from a light from fiber to the waveguide to be on the order of 99 and above percent theoretically, experimentally in telecom wavelength range, 98% and visible wavelength range at the moment about 90 percent uh so 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 and, and this is this kind of adiabatic transition of photon from optical fiber mode to this uh triangular waveguide mode uh so here is now experiments done at uh, kind of uh, uh silicon vacancy wavelength and uh here as i mentioned coupling efficiency is 90 percent which really means that 90 percent of the photons that start in a fiber end up in a diamond waveguide uh, so this is uh, quite nice. We would like to push these uh, uh, coupling efficiencies to like 99%, which really just needs some little more optimization. And in this way, we can also look at optical resonances in reflection. And we uh, this shows some, some uh, optical resonance of about 11,000, uh, which is sort of the best we can do at the moment at, at a wavelength of silicon vacancy color center. Uh, the red line here is. Uh, the transmission that we made, transmission of our uh, reflection of the system that was measured by taking optical fiber and uh, screwing a retro reflector on it. So this measures all, all inefficiencies in our setup. And blue line is when we take optical fiber and touch on diamond device. You can see actually they come very close, uh, uh, which is what results in this 90% coupling efficiency. We also demonstrated uh, that cavity enhanced uh, 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 actually, this is uh, okay, two double source of single photons. This is not with the cavity. This is, these are the Raman transitions. Basically, instead of driving uh, these uh, levels in silicon vacancy and resonance, uh, in order to kind of uh, do entanglement with these two silicon vacancies, you can do all, uh, all, all the, use this Raman process. And this was also summarized in this paper. But recently, what we've done, we enhanced probability of this Raman transition using, again, optical resonator. So uh, using these uh, to kind of showcase importance of this efficient fiber coupling and also cavity enhancement, what we have, uh, we excite uh, 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 off resonance our silicon vacancy from here and collect photons, uh, these Raman photons collect via optical fiber. So we excite this transition and, and get these photons into fiber. And by controlling essentially the pump, wavelength, we can control the color of photons that we're getting. Uh, and so basically, this summarizes the fluorescence rate of these Raman photons that are completely tunable and also narrow bandwidth. Uh, it, when I have silicon vacancy in cavity, on resonance with the cavity, and when I tune this transition to be off resonance with the cavity. So clearly, cavity helps significantly to get us to these indistinguishable photons. So this is another important component that uh, we have in source of indistinguishable photons that can now nicely read out this optical memory that we have in there. And then ideally, now we would like to send this, uh, these photons to 737 nanometers to maybe some lithium niobate, go to 1.5 micron wavelength, send it over hundreds of kilometers, do interference and uh, entangle to silicon vacancies. And this kind of summarizes other stuff that we have done with silicon vacancies, which is actually quite nice, And but uh, I'm, I'm gonna kind of, uh, i going to start running out of time, so I want to skip this. Uh, but basically, in addition to these tunable photons and in addition to this uh, single photon router, uh, uh, we were able to demonstrate that, that uh, uh, this single photon router has memory as well as entangle two silicon vacancies in one uh, diamond waveguides. Uh, and also, I should emphasize, this is, again, work that was done collaboratively with Michel Lucan's group at Harvard. Okay, so uh, uh, also stuff that we're doing going towards this direction 
of integrating everything on the diamond chip, we are also putting some superconducting nanowire single photon detectors on diamond so that we have source of single photons as well as detectors of single photons, but this is a work in progress. I just want to show you some early attempts. We have Niobium titanium nitride superconductor on diamond waveguide, and diamond waveguide has some color centers in it, but this doesn't work quite yet as well. So what are the problems with silicon vacancy? Why is the whole world not working on silicon vacancy if they're so good? Well, the problem is they have really horrible spin coherence. And essentially, uh, in the ground state, uh, and here's some showing this uh, ground state uh, with uh, of applied magnetic field. There's these phonon processes that drive transitions between, uh, due to strong spin orbit coupling, uh, transition between spin up and spin down. And this spoils coherence and it limits it to about 50 nanoseconds or 40 nanoseconds, actually. So this is not very good uh, quantum memory and limits how far your photon can propagate before uh, the information that you stored is lost. Uh, so this is a major limitation of silicon vacancies, and this is something that actually we are very actively looking into. So there's three approaches that uh, we uh, are uh, pursuing to address this. Uh, uh, the kind of most straightforward, the kind of throw the money at the problem approach, and probably the one that's most likely to going to work first, is to cool down these devices to millicalvin temperatures, at which point you don't have a whole lot of photons, phonons anywhere, anyways. So this, these transitions may be actually uh, prevented. And there was some work done on that already. Uh, uh, what with my group we are doing, we are uh, uh, we're, uh, pr pr uh, pursuing these two approaches. One is based on phononic crystal. So instead of building a photonic structure, we would like to build a structure that has band gap for phonons, so that if I band gap is 50 gigahertz, I can actually eliminate density of state for phonons locally and prevent uh, this process completely. So this is uh, my favorite topic right now. So we are looking into this. There are many, many difficulties uh, with this, but it's very interesting. And also in the spirit of this idea of using, using phonons as information carriers. And another one is using strain to separate these levels. So this is illustrated here. If I use strain to separate the levels in the ground state of silicon vacancy, as shown in orange lines, then this kind of energy of phonon needed to drive transition is much higher. So even at 4 Kelvin, I don't have very many phonons uh, with this energy. Okay? So we did some calculations. I'm not going to uh, bore you with these things. But basically, this shows that if we can do this, we can actually potentially improve coherence by a roughly factor of 100. Okay? So if I can split these levels via strain from 50 gigahertz to about 1 terahertz, okay? so it's gigantic, then uh, the, I'm going to kill this transition upward phonon driven process will be eliminated and my spin coherence will improve by half a factor of 100, at which point it will be 4 microseconds and combined with nice properties of silicon vacancy, optical properties, maybe we start being able to do some interesting experiments along the lines of quantum repeater. And how are we going to do this? We're going to use, uh, we are going to use these mechanical resonators that we have quite a bit of experience with now uh, to essentially deflect these mechanical resonators, put color center here, and induce low strain on it. So these are actual devices we made. So here is a diamond cantilever with metal electrodes. And we apply bias voltage between these two metals electrodes. And we drive, deflect this beam. And we also use, again, focused on beam implantation to have these deterministic placement of color centers. And then we are looking at the color centers closer to the clamp where the strain is the largest. So here is an example of uh, this experimental data showing strain response of silicon vacancy uh, that's kind of uh, dipole oriented like this. Uh, we see that originally, if I don't apply any vol voltage, these four lines, that is the four transitions of silicon vacancy, they actually split quite a bit when I apply about 300 volts. Okay, so this is all done in the cryostat, uh, also with the applying magnetic field on it. Okay, so so this is very nice, and here is kind of summarized in this plot. Uh, uh, this is wavelength experimental data showing wavelength uh, as a function of applied voltage. Uh, so th this has another nice consequence, which is not only that we are increasing strain in the ground state, which supposedly will give us improving in coherence of spin, uh, but this can be used to tune emission wavelength of silicon vacancy, which is very important because silicon vacancy, remember, cannot be tuned using DC electric field because it has essentially zero electric dipole, and we confirmed this. So this is a nice way to overcome inhomogeneous broadening between different color centers different silicon vacancy color centers. 
Uh, so I'm going to just uh, kind of briefly summarize that uh, we did do, do a lot of work. We measured coherence also uh, using co coherent population trapping, and we showed that we were able to uh, improve roughly co coherence by factor of eight. So, so we think now that spin coherence time we have in these devices is, has gone from 40 nanoseconds to about 320 nanoseconds. It's not two orders of magnitude that we wanted, but it's getting there. So this is one thing that we're pushing very hard uh, in addition to just cooling devices down to a lower and lower temperature. But this is our heater device where we were able to do this splitting or four uh, uh, emission line for silicon vacancy, uh, and we were able to split them by one terahertz. So, uh, so this is a lot of strain, uh, and this was done with about 600 volt supply to this cantilever, and still survived. It's actually remarkable. I don't want to skip that. Okay, so uh, now that we started looking into strain uh, uh, response for silicon vacancies, we actually started looking into uh, uh, opportunities of using strain fields or acoustic fields in general, phonons, uh, 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 to sort of do something useful for that instead of, them. instead of trying to suppress phonon processes, see if we can use them. And the idea is basically, you know, so, uh, something like this. So, so far we have a bunch of quantum memories that we are wiring up using photons, but what if I want to uh, couple, not uh, these optical memories, but let's say I want to couple superconducting circuits or some of these uh, Coulomb gate uh, quantum dots with my uh, color center in diamond, then these are not responding to photons, but they, everything responds to mechanical motion, everything responds to phonons. Uh, well, can I use then phonons as information carrier to do this hybrid network, for example? And which brings us to this kind of field of quantum optomechanics uh, that we and a few other groups around the world are kind of are now considering, which combines cavity quantum electrodynamics with optomechanics. And our sort of uh, uh, structure that we would like to uh, we are exploring is shown here. So we have our optical cavity that now, by the way, if we put a lot of photons in it, it can start breathing due to radiation pressure. Uh, and that breathing can result to strong optomechanical coupling. So we have optomechanical coupling, and then mechanically, uh, these, these color centers, in this case is an example of NV, but actually we're doing mostly stuff in silicon where you can see now. Uh, uh, the, this uh, uh, spin, the spin orbit coupling and coupling uh, to strain of this color center can couple to mechanical vibration. So now we can couple optics to mechanics to spin. And then also spin couples obviously optically directly anyways. So now we can couple everything to everything. And, and we are, to be honest, trying to figure out what this is good for uh, in addition to being very fun kind of uh, playground. One of the ideas is to use spin uh, strain coupling to cool mechanical degrees of freedom here to essentially uh, do cooling of mechanics. Another one is to cool mechanics using other ways, maybe optics, and then put its mechanics in ground state, and then silicon vacancy can emit 50 gigahertz phonons that can propagate down the phonon waveguide and be collected here with another silicon vacancy. So there's some theory work done by Peter Rabel along those lines. That, uh, so there's a lot of kind of interesting stuff. Uh, what we have demonstrated so far is really just the kind of simplest thing of this system that operates at lower frequencies, about five to six, five to ten gigahertz, which is this uh, operates mostly in the optomechanical mechanical regime. We don't have anything quantum in it yet, but uh, we are just about uh, to start doing these things. So, so I'm going to share with you in the next few minutes just a few slides on this diamond optomechanics, uh, which follows some of the nice work done by Oscar Painter and Amir Safavinaini on silicon optomechanical crystals, uh, which, to be honest, also is not clear to me what they're really good for other than for precision measurements. Uh, but here we wanted to demonstrate uh, uh, in collaboration with Oscar and Amir that uh, actually if you do these things in diamond, you can do something useful uh, 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 with, this, with this coupling. So first we wanted to demonstrate optomechanical crystals in diamond. So for which in addition to engineering photonic band gap and photonic dispersion, we started looking into phononic dispersion. So these are all different mechanical modes with different symmetry that our structure supports. Uh, and in particular, we are interested in these flapping modes of our photonic crystal structure, which is, you know, remember it has triangular cross-section, and flapping mode has these ears of the triangle kind of flapping, uh, as well as swelling mode where the whole thing just kind of blows up due to the pressure of, of the light. Okay? And if you do things properly, I'm skipping a lot of kind of steps here, you can get something like this. The same structure can support optical mode, 
as well as mechanical mode, both flapping and swelling. And optomechanical coupling uh, is on the order of 200 giga, uh, kilohertz. Okay. So this is roughly a factor of 10 lower than what people do in silicon, uh, which is due to the fact that diamond has lower refractive index than silicon. But we can, again, owing due to the diamond's wide band gap, we can put a lot of photons inside diamond. So, so essentially drive this multi-photon optomechanical cooperativity now up despite having very low uh, intrinsic optomechanical coupling rate. Okay, so these are some of the devices that were fabricated and now we moved everything to telecom wavelength range, which is another interesting thing. Now we can address silicon vacancy using telecom photons via mechanical coupling. So telecom photons at 1.5 micron drive radiation pressure result into mechanical motion of cavity that couples to strain and affects spin. Okay, so we don't have to drive it with 737 nanometers. So this is what we would like to do as well. So here is a simple experiment. Uh, the same, we measure first optical resonance. In telecom, they're on the order of 200,000. The best ones are roughly half a million. Then you park your laser on the side, on the side of this Lorentzian, and you uh, send a signal, transmission signal to the uh, spectrum analyzer, and you look at the mechanical resonances. And here's a mechanical resonance of the flapping mode at about five gigahertz. This is mechanical spectrum, this is optical spectrum. And here's another mechanical mode at about 10 gigahertz. So, uh, this is a swelling mode, and these are quality factors, mechanical quality factors. Now, what we want to do, we want to see if we can drive these mechanics with light, okay, as well as we can cool mechanics using light. Uh, so essentially quench mechanical motion or enhance mechanical motion, amplify motion or damp motion. So here we were looking at mechanical line width, which is line width of mechanical resonance as a function of the tuning for particular pump power. And you can see here, if we are on this side of the optical resonance, as shown in blue, mechanical line width goes up. So we are broadening the mechanical line, which means we are essentially using damping in the mechanical motion. We are making quieter and quieter. If I uh, excite the structure on this side of the optical resonance, I am essentially making mechanical line with very small, which means I'm essentially causing it to oscillate. So I'm, I'm adding gain to the structure, so this is oscillation part. Uh, so this is uh, summarized here. So basically this is now the same mechanical line with as a function of number of photons that we put in. And this is uh, now plotted on this side in blue regime. If I uh, put about 7,000 photons inside this resonator, I can get it to oscillate. And at this point, uh, I'm gonna uh, skip this. At this point, uh, my mechanical oscillator, okay, uh, increases in depth amplitude of oscillation about 70 dB. So if I don't put any light in it, I just have Brownian motion, which is the mechanical spectrum looks like this. I start putting more and more light and about 7,000 photons I reach threshold, my, my uh, radiation pressure motion composites all the losses in the structure. And uh, essentially I have mechanical resonance kind of blows up. And this is a dB scale, by the way. So at that point, the, the structure is shaking tremendously and there's huge amount of strain inside it that we would now like to probe with silicon vacancy centers. Uh, in, in quantum regime, we would like to be on the other side of the resonance basically here, uh, where we would cool mechanical motion and then try to put it in, uh, in the ground state and do this kind of phonon routing and whatnot. Okay, so that brings me to a summary uh, that essentially, uh, uh, I guess, uh, there's a lot of work that's been done that kind of originally started with the quantum optics with diamond that then uh, got us excited about exploring the linearity with diamond and lately optical mechanics with diamond. Uh, and I think very, very soon we'll, uh, we'll be in a regime where uh, 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 cooperativity or cavity QED experiment is gonna be above 10 and optomechanical cooperativity, which I kind of skipped uh, that is already uh, the order of 20. I think it can be in, in thousands very soon. So then combining these two effects will be able, ideally we would like to with one photon, put one phonon mode and, and then couple to one spin. So this I would like to do, I wanna skip this. I wanna show you the people who do the work, who turn diamond from this into that. So Mike uh, developed a lot of fab. These guys uh, did a lot of optomechanics. Young Kastrujans are primarily in, uh, driving a silicon vacancy strain coupling uh, project. Uh, Mike also collaborates with Misha on KVT QED. Paul and Vivek do nonlinear optics and frequency comm and Raman lasers. Uh, and Haig has been doing this work on superconducting signal photon detector on diamond as well as some other stuff. Uh, 
uh, Ian Eichun is doing some work with plasmonics and silicon vacancies I didn't have a chance to tell you about. These are past people, past students uh, who uh, started a dime on the effort in my group. Funding sources, I mentioned collaboration with Looking Lab, Sandia. This strain coupling was also done in Meta Eta Tours Group uh, in Cambridge. Uh, Optimechanics Mechanics we do with, with Painter Lab at Caltech, and Element 6 grows diamond for us. And with that, I hope that I convinced you that as Andre, Alexei, sorry, suggested that diamond is not only girls' best friend, but also engineers' best friend uh, as well. Okay, so thanks for your attention. You mean how much do you need to move? Yeah, so uh, I don't remember. Uh, you need to put 600 volts, which doesn't tell you anything. Uh, I should, uh, 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 I don't remember. But we do calibrate, we know exactly, uh, that's how we go back from voltage to strain. We calibrate the flexion. We know how much it moves, and then using console modeling, we know roughly, based on modeling, what kind of strain that puts in, and then we correlate this with the center of mass motion. So I don't know. Uh, they are separated by a micron or so from the diamond, so no more than a micron, maybe a few hundred nanometers. You mean the whole idea of the cavity? Right, so it's not that we oppose the more we really uh, enhance emission in this particular wavelength. All right, this is uh, kind of the, the idea behind Purcell enhancement in general. You, you, you can because the, gamma, the rate of the emission is basically the rate into zero phonon line plus the rate of phonon sibin. So if I enhance, and in, in diamond, zero phonon line is, uh, uh, phonon sibin is 20 times zero phonon line. So now when I put Purcell, when the cavity in the zero phonon line, I have Purcell factor times zero phonon line rate plus sibin. So if that F is 1,000, then it's 50 times more likely that photon is going to come out at zero phonon line than the phonon sibin. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, yeah, okay. yeah. That's easy way to say it. Yeah. Uh, uh, not really. I mean, some, there's a, I think uh, it's charge fluctuations induced. I think we notice it's a lot very, uh, particularly on etched sidewalls. Like it's less sensitive for to, when it's just surface, for example. When I, I have these etched sidewalls, uh, it's more sensitive. So it, it kind of makes us uh, think that you know, there's a lot of implanted stuff. When you do etching, you also implant stuff. Uh, so we implant oxygen maybe. In fact, we discovered new color center like this uh, a few years ago, oxygen related. Uh, you can, we tried now to remove this damaged layer, lay, uh, layer by annealing and uh, uh, aggressive acid etching, as well as the oxidation of diamond. So we remove five, 10 nanometers of that diamond and still doesn't improve. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, this is communities puzzled. I don't know, do you have your version of uh, yeah, it's been very unpleasant uh, for many years. So we thought so it's Brownian motion due to mechanical, you mean? No. 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 Ah, oh, what is the, I see, you're saying if we can measure statistics of the motion, maybe that, which is a very good point. Uh, never, I don't think anybody did that, to be honest. Uh, just maybe, yeah, no, sorry, I don't think anybody, it's been interesting. Yeah. To be honest, I, I don't do anything with NV anymore. It's like uh, it's like I have nightmares now. So we just fix the other color center. Right. 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 So we're talking about focus on implantation, right? Yeah. Because first, focus on being milling is really kind of can be really bad for diamond. Uh, this is done with gallium. So here, okay, so we implant right now about 100 silicon, I mean, we, Sandia tells us, they implant roughly 100 uh, silicon atoms, and the yield of conversion is roughly 5% or something. That, that's where these three come, come from. 
So now that we, have, we have other 100 atoms in about 50, and by the way, I forgot to mention, it's about 40 nanometers uh, precision that they can do this, this uh, uh, focus kind of implementation. That also causes a lot of local strain and fluctuations and whatnot. So once our yield improves, we'll have fewer silicon atoms around, so it's going to be better. So the way they uh, say they could uh, monitor uh, this process and how you know they, they do this, essentially they, they monitor uh, back uh, secondary emitted electrons. When ion goes in, they see the secondary emitted electrons, and then at some point they just shatter the beam and they don't implant anymore. They also have techniques where they actually monitor like if you put electrodes on diamond or whatever material you're implanting in, you can monitor current between the generated by ion going in, and that's even better apparently, but that causes uh, result, uh, calls for some fab, additional fab, so we don't do that. Uh, so they claim, I mean, when you talk to them, they can shut it down at, at one level. We'd be happy with probably 10 uh, 